As we begin this morning, I would say that we are, as a people and as a nation, unusually blessed. In the course of human history, we enjoy blessings and rights and privileges that many people have not enjoyed. In 1781, our Bill of Rights was ratified, and in that Bill of Rights, the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So we have this First Amendment right that says that the Congress shall not enact a law that establishes a particular religion, that chooses a favorite, and it shall make no law that prohibits the free exercise of religion. That is a tremendous right that many people in history have not enjoyed. During the time of the early church, during the time of the book of Acts, that was a right that they did not enjoy. In the book of Acts, the early apostles preaching in Jerusalem did not have a freedom of religion and worship and faith and proclamation. And so the question might be, how should the Christian respond when he doesn't enjoy that freedom of religion? What should the Christian do if the government were to enact some sort of prohibition towards the free exercise of religion? Well, let's turn to Acts chapter 5, because in Acts 5, beginning in verse 12, I think we see the answer to that question. Now, as we look through the book of Acts, remember, the church began in chapter 2 at Pentecost, and the apostles preached, and they preached with great power, and it says 3,000 believed. And then in chapter 3, they continued in chapter 4, and they continued to preach and offer the gospel again to the nation Israel, and 5,000 men believed. And so the church is growing in the book of Acts. Remember chapter 1, verse 8, it says in the theme verse, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. So in other words, they were witnesses, and at this point they're witnesses in Jerusalem. And that's what we're seeing, and we're seeing the witness of the apostles. And beginning in verse 12, and it says, At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's portico. So the apostles were giving tremendous witness, and God was accomplishing signs and wonders and miracles through them. Now, I I think we need to see that not every Christian did that. In 2 Corinthians 12, 12, The Apostle Paul says, The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance by signs and wonders and miracles. So it's not that every Christian did signs, wonders, and miracles. Then they would be called the signs of a Christian. But he says the signs of a true apostle were performed among you. And so God was using them to validate the message. And so that's what we see in verse 12. Then in verse 13, but none of the rest dared associate with them. However, the people held them in high esteem. And I think the none of the rest probably refers to the other Christians. They even held the apostles in such high esteem that they they, they didn't associate with them or were reluctant to. And then the people, I think that probably refers to the Jewish nation, the people that came into the temple area in the complex and would hear them preach and would see them and were aware of the miracles that they did, that they also were held in high esteem. And it says, and all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women were constantly added to their number. So many people believed to such an extent that they even carried the sick. What does it say here? Sick out into the streets and laid them on cots and pallets so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on any one of them. So other than the Lord Jesus, Peter and Paul had the greatest of gifts of healing. And it would seem here that Peter was, was, was able, walking through the street, his shadow would fall on them and people would be healed. And then the next verse, see what it says there, uh, verse 16, also the people from the, dist- or from the cities 
in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all being healed. So it wasn't just even Jerusalem now. We would say, as Acts 1.8 says, in all Judea, that people from the nearby cities were bringing people into the cities, and Peter and the apostles were performing signs, wonders, and miracles, and it says they were all being healed. There wasn't anybody that was sent home where they said, well, sorry, uh, we can't do anything for you, or, or sorry, the meeting's over. But everybody who came, they were healed. So you see, there was a great display of the power of God. And so the the witness, the ministry to the people was great, but not everybody responded in a positive way. Verse 17, but the high priest rose up along with all the associates, that is the sect of the Sadducees. And if you remember, the two main sects in Judaism were the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the Sadducees controlled the high priesthood. They were corrupt. They had bought the high priesthood from the Romans. They were pretty much theological liberals. The Pharisees were pretty conservative, but they both found common ground in opposing Christ. But here, though, the Sadducees were jealous, and it says they were filled with jealousy, Kind of reminds me when they delivered up Jesus and Pilate was aware that they delivered him up because of jealousy. And so they were filled with jealousy. And it says they laid hands on the apostles and put them in a public jail. But what does it say in the next verse? But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the gate of the prison and taking them out, he said, go stand and speak to the people in the temple. The whole message of this life. So you see another sign, another miracle. The apostle or the angel delivered the apostles and delivered them so that they were able to leave the jail. And yet apparently from what we'll read in a, in a few moments, the, the doors were locked and the guards were still there. And here in this situation here, he, he releases them, but he doesn't tell them to flee. But he says, go right back to the temple and continue to teach. And he says, continue to teach this or the words of this life. And Christianity is a message of life. It's a message of the life that God can give, a message of eternal life and new life. And so that's what they were told to do, even though they had just been arrested there. In verse 21, and upon hearing this, they entered into the temple about daybreak and began to teach. So they continued to teach in the temple. Well, what would happen as a result in verse 21? Now when the high priest and the associates came, they called the council together. And the word for council there is Sanhedrin. Sometimes you'll hear that word Sanhedrin, which meant 70 leaders of Israel who were overseeing the affairs of the nation. They called the Sanhedrin together, even all of the Senate of the sons of Israel, and sent orders to the prison house for them to be brought. So the orders were to summon the apostles. But the officers who came did not find them in the prison, and they returned and reported back, saying, we found the prison house locked quite securely, and the guards standing at the doors. But when we had opened up, we found no one inside. So the apostles are gone. Now when the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them as to what would come of this. So they they did not know the answer. But someone came and reported to them, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. So you see, they continue to teach, they continue to witness, they continue to proclaim the gospel. Then the captain went along with the officers and proceeded, and it says here, to bring them back without violence, for they were afraid of the people that they might be stoned. So they were going to bring them back without force. And when they had brought them, they stood them before the council, and the high priest questioned them. Now, the New American Standard says he questioned them, but then it'll go on to say in the next few verses, I don't see any question at all. It was just a rebuke. It was a, 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 a rebuke uh, of them. But it says he questioned them. So in a sense, we could say he's going to indict them. This is his indictment, saying, we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching teaching 
in this name. And yet, you have filled Jerusalem and your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Several things to note here. This is one of the greatest compliments they could have received because he says, you have filled Jerusalem with this teaching. And that's exactly what Acts 1.8 says. You shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and even the remotest parts of the earth. And here their enemies say, you have filled Jerusalem with this teaching. So they were very successful. One commentator had said they were the most successful generation in church history. When you think about it, they began in such a small group. And by the end of the book of Acts, the church has spread throughout the known world at the time. They had filled Jerusalem with this teaching. And that's for sure. And notice also he says, you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Which is kind of ironic because in Matthew, 7, or Matthew chapter 27, they said, all the people said, his blood be on us and on our children. So at that time they were happy to bring the blood upon them. But now they no longer want that. Now, of course, the nation Israel rejected Messiah. The Gentiles rejected Messiah. The world rejected Messiah. And notice also he says, this man. And it seems that there's an aversion, particularly of those who do not believe. They don't want to say the name Jesus. I've even experienced that with certain groups of people. They do not want to say the name Jesus. But notice what he says here. He said, you filled the city with the teaching about this name, and you intend to bring this man's blood. But they, they don't want to say the name Jesus. Of course, in the book of Acts, the name Jesus, it says, is a wonderful name. And there's salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. It's quite a name. And it's a wonderful name to be able to say the name Jesus but they don't want to say the name Jesus. And so he says, you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. So that's the indictment. That's the rebuke. And the question is this, what should the church do? What should a Christian do? What should you do if someone says, you cannot witness in the name of Jesus? You cannot teach in the name of Jesus? Well, I think the answer is right here. In verse 29, but Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than man. We must obey God rather than men. In other words, God has given us a commission. God has given us a message. God has given us an imperative. And if it comes down to a government that says you cannot preach the name of Jesus we're going to preach the name of Jesus because he's the Messiah and this is God's message. And really, that's the answer to the question. What should a Christian do? And the answer to the question is, we must obey God rather than men. Well, let's continue on because I think the apostle here continues in a sense to make an appeal to them. He says, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus. And when he says our there, I think he's including them still. I think he's continuing to make an appeal to them. There's this continuous appeal to the nation Israel, even in the book of Acts, because God has foreknown the nation Israel. And he says, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you put to death by hanging him on a cross. Now, really a better translation there is you hung him on a tree, and the reason why he says a tree is because in the book of Deuteronomy, it says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And I think what Peter is saying here is you humiliated him in every way you could. You hung him on a tree, which would have been the worst type of death imagined because it says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now, the Apostle Paul will later tell us in the book of Galatians that that was part of God's design because Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become made a curse for us, as it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. When Jesus hung on a tree, he hung on a tree to take the curse that belongs to all those who don't keep the law perfectly. So if you haven't kept the law perfectly, you're under a curse. And by the way, nobody's kept the law perfectly, and everyone's under 
a curse. But when Jesus was hung on a cross on a tree, he redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. He took your curse. Or as Johnny said, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It was the great transaction, the great exchange. Our sins go to him. He pays the penalty. His righteousness comes to us. We receive it as a gift. And that's the gospel. And that's what Peter is saying here. And I think if you look in the book, well, in the whole New Testament, you see the message is given over and over again to the nation. Jesus presented himself, and it says, they said, this man cast out demons by Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. So they rejected him. He's presented at the triumphal entry, and it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem, for behold, your king is coming to you. And yet it said they didn't receive him. He came to his own, and his own received him not. Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I would gather you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. You see, he continues to present the message to them. And then in the book of Acts, chapter 2, house of Israel, let the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And it says they were pierced to the heart and said, what shall we do? And Peter said, repent and let each one of you be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, does God offer a second chance? He absolutely offered the nation Israel a second chance. Did he give them a third chance? He absolutely gave them a third chance. You go to Acts chapter 3, the same thing. It says, repent therefore and return that times of refreshing may come and that he'll wipe away your sins. Does he give them a fourth? chance he gives him a fourth chance even here does he give him another chance he gives him a fifth chance and you know throughout history there are always Jewish people that are going to believe and in the meantime the Gentiles are invited to come and believe the gospel as well and there will be a day when the nation Israel as a whole will believe in Romans chapter 11 it says and thus All Israel will be saved as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion and remove ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them. When I take away their sins, a great day ahead, but it's a great day now to proclaim the message of Christ. And that's what he says, the God of our fathers raised him up. You hung him on a tree. But it says in the next verse, He is the one whom God exalted to the right hand as a savior, excuse me, as a prince and a savior. And look what he says. To grant or give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. I think he continued to offer them again the gospel. And to grant there means to give. Now it's interesting, I believe repentance is a gift. I believe faith is a gift. On the other hand, the Bible also says God calls you to repent and God calls you to believe. And what repentance means is an acknowledgement of guilt and inability, an acknowledgement there's nothing you can do. And faith is then turning to Christ and trusting in what he did. And it says when you do that, you have the forgiveness of sins and you have this life that he's talking about. And God grants that as a free gift. And then it says, and we are witnesses of these things. And notice the word witnesses. That's a word that's always in the book of Acts. And it should be a word that we think about because you're a witness and I'm a witness. And God wants us to be witnesses of these things. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit. And he's the one that gave them power. And he's the one that can give us power It says, God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Now, I think at this point, that last phrase was probably a little too much for them. Because look what the next verse says. But when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and intended to kill them. In other words, they'd heard enough. And just as they intended and they did kill Jesus, 
they intended to kill them as well. But then God raises up someone who intervenes. It says, but a Pharisee, and that's interesting in the book of Acts because we're going to see that even though the Pharisees and the Sadducees generally were against Jesus, they also historically, and even in the book of Acts, were sometimes against each other. And sometimes the Pharisees would come to the defense of, of even the Apostle Paul later on in the book of Acts. And here, this man is a Pharisee. The Sadducees were well-to-do and controlled the priesthood and corruptly had bought that influence or that power from the Romans. The Pharisees were pretty legalistic, but theologically conservative. They believed in angels. They believed in spirits. They believed in a resurrection. Sadducees didn't believe in any of that. And they didn't always agree with each other. So here this Pharisee named Gamaliel speaks up. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and gave orders to put the men outside for a short time. Now this man Gamaliel is a man that we'll see later in the book of Acts is referred to as one who had actually taught the apostle Paul as a young man. The Apostle Paul had learned from Gamaliel. And Gamaliel, history tells us, was the grandson of a famous rabbi, I think perhaps uh, Hillel. And so he has an interesting take on things. And he said to them, men of Israel, take care what you propose to do with these men. For some time ago, and now he's going to give two historical instances Thutis rose up claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 joined up with him, but he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. So somebody claimed to be probably some type of a spiritual leader, maybe even a Messiah. 400 people followed him, but he was killed, and his movement came to nothing. After this man, Judas, Judas of Galilee, rose up in the days of the census, and drew away some people after him. He also perished with all those who followed that were scattered. So you see another man, Judas, rose up, claimed to be somebody great, but it all came to naught. It's interesting, you can read in Josephus, a secular historian of the time, mentions this man, Judas. And his point is that these people claimed to be somebody special, but their movements came to nothing. And so now he says in the next verse, so in the present case, I say to you, stay away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or action is of men, it will be overthrown. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them or else you may even be found fighting against God. So his advice was stay away, stand back, leave them alone. Now, again, it's not the best advice. The best advice is to believe them. But it's better advice than to kill them. And so he has an interesting take on things. Stand back, because if it is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you will not be able to resist them, and you might find yourselves even to be fighting against God. And so that was his device. Verse 40 says, they took his advice, and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then release them. I think it's a little ironic. It says they took his advice, and then they flogged them. I mean, to flog them, that's generally would refer to receiving 40 lashes. Now, the Pharisees are kind of, it's not funny, but it's kind of funny. They were always careful. They didn't want to make a mistake, so they'd only give 39 lashes in case somebody miscounted, so they would be sure that they didn't give too many. But let's say they got 39 or maybe 38. What do you think? But either way, that's not really leaving them alone. They flogged them, and then they released them. And you think at this point, the apostles would say, "Uh, well, we've had enough. Well, not so. What does it say in verse 41? So they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing. That's a funny way to respond to a flogging. Rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And then what'd they do? And every day in the temple, in the temple, that's like the square. 
and in the temple, and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching, and that's evangelizing, that's the word there, Jesus is the Christ. They continued in their proclamation. So what's the point of the passage this morning? Well, we began by saying, we live in a country where we have the free exercise of religion. And what a wonderful right that is. But if we were in a situation like the apostles, what should the Christian do? If there's a prohibition against the free exercise of religion, he says here, we must obey God rather than men. God's commission, God's message, God's imperative, God's instruction is to preach the gospel. And God's a higher authority than any human authority. It's interesting in American history, and I'm not teaching American religion at all, but some people in American history, John Adams and John Hancock, are attributed with the saying, we recognize no sovereign but God and no king but Jesus. We have a great history. We have a wonderful history of godly people. John Hancock said that all may bow to the scepter of our Lord Jesus Christ and that the whole earth may be filled with his glory. James Madison, who wrote the Bill of Rights, said, Cursed be all that learning that is contrary to the cross of Christ. What a great history. And there are other quotes as well. But my point here this morning is to encourage and teach what the Bible says. And if the question is, to whose allegiance does the Christian ultimately fall under? It's at highest allegiance is to God and his message and his gospel. And so if there's a question, now the Bible tells us to be submissive to governing authorities in all things, for there is no authority except those established by God. And uh, uh, authorities are, 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 what does it say? They're, they're uh, uh, servants of God appointed for our good. But if they overstep their bounds and get into God's territory and prohibit the preaching of the gospel, the Christian has another command. And we might say if they get into the area of making or mandating or requiring the Christian to sin, the Christian's not responsible to do that either. But the general principle is to obey. But the exceptions are the ones I've mentioned. If they prohibit the preaching of the gospel, the gospel says we must obey God rather than men. But I think that principle can even transcend into other areas. What, what if there's some unethical decision? How are you going to respond? What are you going to do? I would say this passage would say we must obey God rather than men. What if somebody wants you to do something popular but it's not right? This passage says we must obey God rather than men. What if somebody says, well, I'd like to witness to my friend, but they may not like me. They may laugh at me. What does this passage say? We must obey God rather than men. In other words, he's saying this is our, our priority, and we should recognize that not all are going to believe. It's not going to always be popular. What's popular is not always right, and what's right is not always popular, but the gospel is true, and it's right always. And so the passage says we must obey God rather than men. And I'd say here, if you've never trusted in Christ, be a part of this great message. Be a part of this great movement of God. And remember what we said a little bit earlier. It, the Bible says, cursed is everyone who does not perform all things written in the book of the law to, to perform them. In other words, if you have not kept the Ten Commandments perfectly your whole life, and I might say nobody has, well, then the Bible says you're under a curse. You're under a curse, meaning an object of divine wrath, because you have not kept the righteous law of God. But the gospel is, Jesus Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become made a curse for us. He died in your place, took your penalty, became curse for you, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so if you trust in him, you're forgiven. And you can receive the, this life as a free gift. So to conclude, what are we saying here? If the question is, who do we obey? It says we must obey God rather than men. And if the question is, how can I be forgiven? We trust in the Lord Jesus and his death on the cross as the full payment for sins. And that, my friends, is the good news of the gospel. Let's pray.
Lord, we come to you, we worship you. Help us as we think of this word today to remember the verse, we must obey God rather than men. Help us to remember that as we face decisions. Maybe sometimes we're embarrassed to say, I believe in Jesus. The apostles said we must obey God rather than men. Help us to be strong. Help us to be filled with the Spirit. Help us to have courage. Help us to be men as it says. And if there's one who's never trusted in Christ, I invite you, friend, to make a decision to pray with me. Dear God, I don't trust in what I've done, for I have not kept the commandments perfectly. But I trust that Jesus paid my penalty. He suffered in my place. He shed his blood for me. I trust that his blood, his life, was the payment for my sins. I trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I receive the free gift of eternal life. And Father, we pray and ask all this in Jesus' name, and we praise you. Amen.